I am. I'm going to bring it up. I, I can't. It's unfortunate because you can't really tell. Yeah. Uh, the ban the banner across the whole middle line. Uh, I found as part of the uh, an art um, digital art display of, from the Smithsonian um, National East Asian Collection, but um, this is actually a ten meter long scroll. Um, you obviously, for, for the purposes, it obviously didn't fit into the width. Made it very small, but uh, in it are all the Chan patriarchs, and so seated next to each other one by one. Um, but uh, I just liked it. But I wanted to include it. Smithsonian. Actually, I've, I've seen it. Have you? Yeah. Pretty amazing. Very impressive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, again, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, this week's discussion, obviously, is on the early formation and characteristics of Chan Buddhism. Uh, another installment in the intro to East Asian Buddhism <laughs> series. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had talked about Pure Land practice, um, and that is it's, it's a committed way in which Shmirti, the, the a focused, purposeful attention to a devotional pack practice of chanting a Buddha's name, envisioning, and being part of their pure land can be a way towards awakening. In discussing Chan tonight, I want to echo some of those same intentions, that same Shmirti, uh, awareness and mindfulness and purposefulness, because Chan is considered the other Chinese practice school. Uh, the other two, uh, and the two doctrinal schools, Hua Hien and Tiantai. Again, <laughs> again, these are not schools in the way that we might define them today. These were movements, trends, uh, traditions in areas of concentration. Uh, one, may, uh, one of many means to an end. But when I mentioned these four, uh, Chan, Pure Land, uh, Tiantai, and Hua Hien, during our last discussion, I should have maybe explained a bit better and to say that these four groupings would have been developments in the theory and practice that was com of Buddhism coming into China that then were becoming strictly Chinese origin. So therefore, Chan is the Chinese use of meditation practice. We'll talk about Chan's general history and some of the philosophical underpinnings and end with how this early trend became a huge movement later on. But obviously, for context's sake, I do want to provide some reminders about what had been going on previously up to this point with early Mahayana um, in, in coming into East Asia. Taking the, the practice of meditation as an example, since that's what we're talking about, by the time it was being introduced to China, it had already gone through centuries of use and development. Meditation wasn't new. It, it's not like it wasn't being done before the Chinese version. Shakyamuni Buddha sat in meditation under the Bodhi tree, gave discourses and instructions on how to meditate in the Satipatthana Sutta in this part of the Pali Canon. And it was considered an advanced practice for the well um, experienced spiritual seeker. The image that you see in the slide is that of the Pashupati seal from around 2000 BCE. We, we obviously, I can't confirm that the guy's meditating in the seal there, but still, uh, the point is that meditation isn't even new to Buddhism. Again, everything coming into China from Central Asia, starting around the turn of the Common Era, had its own history, and then was being imported. Imported into a society that in and of itself had its own traditions, perspectives. And Buddhism, and particularly early Mahayana teachings and ideals, grew into that. Thus, Chan is simply the first syllable of the Chinese transcription of Chana from the Sanskrit Dhyana. Meditation practitioners may have also done many other practices, studied, studied many other things, but in general, those who passionately and wholeheartedly devoted themselves to this particular practice would have been called Changshi, the meditation masters. And I'm, I apologize, my, my, my tonal is not. <laughs> um, the early iterations of Chinese Chan were thus simply small groups of devout Chinese practitioners centered around these masters, 
predominantly using a certain method. But again, non-exclusivist. All these methods and teachings were movements, ways of practicing, ways of thinking, ways of accessing and experiencing the Dharma. Those at the, uh, at the time literally called these practices Dharma gates, in, each in their own way providing a doorway, um, a, a doorway that we can walk through. Again, relating it back to the four main, what I'll call divisions of Chinese Buddhism, of Hua Hian, Tiantai, Chan, and Pure Land, I see it as a big Venn diagram, as we kind of discussed in the question portion of the last discuss, uh, uh, well, Pure Land discussion. They, they each have their own development, but each influence each other and are also conversely influenced by the other. But the actual early history of Chang is, is really hard to nail down. I, I would say, you know, tenuous is a little far-fetched, but fluid. Um, the lineage, lineages and traditions um, are usually given in retrospect meaning that many of the naming of patriarchs are done by their disciples, which at least helps to prove that their particular teachings carried on, <laughs> that they survived. Um, but case in point, the, the first named patriarch of Chan uh, is Bodhidharma, the, the Bodhidharma, uh, Daruma in Japan. Mostly legendary, um, probably, <coughs> probably based on a South Indian prince, uh, but a practiced monk, nonetheless, who comes to China with the meditation teachings around 5th, 6th century. Um, we only get these historical accounts of his life from Chinese sources from a couple centuries later. Regardless of the tales and myths around the Bodhidharma, um, which could be and ha has been a discussion probably at some point already. Yep. Um, <laughs> it, it, that's a whole other story. The scroll there is a picture of him. Um, generally speaking, it, it, it lends itself to this idea that a, a tradition was being developed. And the, the using of meditative techniques with a focus on using, using the Lakapantara Sutra with uh, emphasis upon the Tathagatagarbha, that seed of awakening in all of us, and Shunyata, thusness or emptiness. The use of meditation became a way to open the mind to these philosophical concepts. For example, last week, Kaiden uh, talked about the dharmas or phenomena and, and the perfection of wisdom. Deeply philosophical stuff, but this would have been the philosophical fodder that fed the meditative practice. And some trends worked and some didn't. Some techniques were better than others. Some leaders more charismatic, enough to teach and inspire enough people to instill a trust to use this method. Some were heavily influenced by Taoist techniques and, uh, and a lot of Taoist perspectives and, and vice versa. Centers of practice started to form, in particular in the fourth and fifth, with the fourth and fifth patriarchs around the turn of the seventh century, forming the East Mountain tradition then there seemed to be a big perspective shift by the late of the 7th century. Uh, a major division arose. Slide. Again, although there were slowly starting to formalize various lineage, lineages and traditions, a major perspective shift caused a bifurcation of the Chinese meditative movement on the whole. Again, probably it did not seem as much at the time while it was happening, but the history has shown how much things have changed since. <clears throat> because, <clears throat> because an otherwise underreported figure, Hui Nan, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, Hui Nan, uh, again at the end of the seventh century, becomes the sixth, sixth patriarch. <clears throat> and not that there's a whole lot of history about him, but Enough to say that his disciples, coming after him, attributed a lot of his teachings, and there's a whole story about him and his life, um, attributed a lot of his teachings and his life <coughs> to the Platform Sutra, creating the Platform Sutra in his name. So there's a whole story, right? Um, Rinang, 
He's attributed to be a, an uneducated layman <clears throat> who suddenly attains awakening by listening to the Diamond Sutra. Despite his, his uh, formal training, he demonstrates through the writing of poetry to the fifth patriarch that he is far superior than his named public successor and therefore um, usurps that, uh, that lineage and in secret takes on the successorship. Um, moves uh, has to move away based on trials and tribulations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, frankly, um, within a, a few centuries, historians mostly debunked the story. But that is to say that in the end, the, the what came out of it was this sutra, <clears throat> which <clears throat> becomes pivotal um, to a lot of Chan uh, philosophical philosophical formation going forward. Um, this. Uh, it, and would have been compiled in a few centuries after Priyanam. The sutra is significant in that it's called a sutra, knowing well that it comes way after any sort of possibility of Shakyamuni Buddha saying any of these words. However, I digress. It, it also made a major argument against the general perspective within Chan at, of that time, and namely that, that one attains awakening gradually that as we experience our Buddha nature over time. Instead, it argued a more Diamond Sutra perspective, a Prajnaparamita focus, in that shunyata is experienced, or it's not. Thus, awakening is sudden, and in the moment, or it's not. A, a quote from the Sutra, the Dharma lives uh, from the Platform Sutra, the, the Dharma lives within the world. Awakening is not apart from the world. To search for Bodhi, uh, awakening, apart from the world, is like looking for horns on a rabbit. It's, it's, it's here, it, it's, it's now, it's in this. this. This shift later becomes known as the Southern School of Chan Buddhism, as opposed to the Northern and Gradual School. This, this echoed the growing popularity that the Prajnaparamita and the Diamond Sutra particularly were, were gaining influence at this time. Again, generally speaking, this perspective shift over time would have huge influential effects to the meditative practice on the whole. But more on that in a little bit. To help to draw some better distinctions of the, the gradual versus sudden perspectives, we can consider the, the conceptual shift this way. As I've already alluded to, the question remains, does one have to work diligently towards awakening gaining in bits over time, or is it experienced fully developed in a single instant? The, the gradual perspective required a long period of study it, it, um, and practice of mindful observance. <laughs> the su sudden relied on the Mahayana ideal that all dualisms are ultimately unreal, including delusion and awakening, practice and attainment, and samsara and nirvana. This was not a new debate. Remember, Juri makes reference to it in his Five Periods and Four Flavors. <clears throat> in, on, the, on the left, you see the four methods of, methods of conversion. Um, that is, methods towards awakening. From Juri's perspective, Shakyamuni uh, Buddha taught in all of these ways. This schemata was not universally accepted, but it did predate the Platform Sutra as did the Huahian school on the whole, which, as you see, this uh, Huahian being that of the sudden teaching. And so both may have contributed to Chan's evolu this, this particular Chan evolution. Regardless of where we stand on the debate, we can imagine that this sudden awakening idea would be really enticing. Along with social and political systems changing in China at the time, much of the gradual method perspectives faded from popular usage. Obviously, this division didn't separate the fact that the two schools had a tremendous amount um, in common. And during the latter Tang dynasty, that is, uh, um, latter half of the 8th into the 11th centuries, Chan really flourished. The other factions slash schools took shape, again, not wholly different, but different enough in approach, emphasis, particular teachings, etc. Eventually, the northern and southern classification dies out, 
but the influence of the, of the sudden awakening argument became a standard doctrine of Chan Buddhism, so much so that the subsequent changes in the methods and objects of meditation um, continue to have their influence today. Imagine for a second that you're arguing for a sudden awakening using, using the teachings of non-dualism uh, and shunyata, thusness, as the main argument. Then how do you use dualisms to teach it? How, how can you explain how to do something or not do something when inherently in your meditation you are seeing the empty nature of them? How, how, do you, how can you relate to your students this thing, this awakening, without concepts? If it is empty, if it, there is shunyata, teaching becomes really difficult. There were examples of teachers um, using quite eccentric methods to help teach their students. Random shouting during meditation, or seemingly nonsensical answers to questions, all as a way to bend the practitioner's mind out of a conceptual understanding. Munching Sensei talks about um, a story of a Zen master he used to sit with, who would suddenly yell, wake up, during a meditation. This kind of jolting out of phenomenal thinking typified that sudden method. In, the, in this, in time, developed what we now call koan, albeit less dramatic in the moment, um, still just as profound. They're simple phrases with little or no intellectual answer, but are to be sources of contemplation. They're said to help the practitioner see beyond the conceptual formation of the phrase itself as a way to experience shunyata. The, the, this technique also had a different distinct influence and that of the need for a strong transmission of teaching. Thus, further encouraging a student-teacher relationship that could be relied upon in order to help communicate this wordless experience. These teachings would obviously become very popular and for our purposes, especially within its introduction to Japan in the 12th century. Even, even though there may have been an established norm of the sudden approach taking dominance, it doesn't mean that the gradual perspective went away entirely. Um, these were five schools that came uh, can be formed um, within Chan, in China. Um, but in particular, I want to point out the two uh, listed, Lin Ji and Cao Dong. Um, one, of the, one of the sudden approach and one of the gradual. Uh, there is an argument that Lin Ji would be more considered more um, Majamaka, um, with the focus on Shunyata, and Cao Dong being more Yogichara, mind only, focusing on Tathagatagarbha. One on the Diamond, one more on the Diamond Sutra, one more on Lak Lakavantara Sutra. These differences play a part in then how these approaches were exported to Japan, for example. Isai, the founder of Rinzai, being influenced by Lin Ji School and Dogen, the founder of Soto, with Cao Dong. We'll go into a lot more detail when we discuss those schools in later discussions. But back in China, much of these schools either merged together late in later centuries, changed further, disappear altogether, or even get reintroduced from schools from China and Korea. Uh, from <coughs> Korea and Japan, sorry. There is a, a lot of history, obviously, to unpack there, but suffice it to say that the development of the Chinese form of meditation has had lasting impacts. Many of our current contemplative practices come out of this development, much like those we discussed in relation to the Pure Land practices. And Jiri, again, emphasizes the use of meditation in the manual he wrote on how to do it, the Shoshikan and Makashikan. The, the Chan school in China today is one of the most popular schools, um, though it's often combined with pure land Buddhism, but that's a whole other topic. Um, I mean, think about how, what the impact that Chan, Son in Korea, Zen in Japan has had on those respective countries, and then just let alone what it's had on, on the West. 
think about what meditation has become and how accessible it has become and how it's become utilized, for better or for worse. The, the development of Chan Buddhism and the lasting impacts it's had only bolstered the purposefulness and effectiveness of a meditative practice. Like Pure Land, like any teachings and practices, if they don't work, they're not going to last. Meditation has been and will be an important way to experience the Dharma. I equate it to a skill, like we, um, a skill that we have to learn, like playing an instrument. You can teach me about the instrument, the concepts, the ideas, the principles behind it. You can even teach me the notes and how to read music. But that doesn't teach me how to play. That doesn't teach me how to experience that making of music. The doing of the skill, rather than simply the theory behind it. They go hand in hand. Both are necessary. Chan Buddhism is concerned with how to be in, in the present, to look into the nature of reality, and, and values that each of us can apply for the Buddhist compassion and wisdom to help ourselves, and at the same time, help others. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, one more slide. <laughs> Questions and comments. Um, I, will, I will first, uh, before we um, open it up to everyone. Is that one name? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly by now, I probably. Um, oh, I will ask Ichishima Sensei or, and or Monchin Sensei if there were anything that you guys wanted to add in relation to early Chan development. So please, Ichishima Sensei, if, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, in China, as well as in Tibet, uh, they had uh, there were such uh, debates between sudden and gradual. And in the case of uh, uh, Tibet, uh, Kamara Shira from India came to uh, Tibet, and then, uh, and also uh, as a monk from China, they discussed together. At in that uh, as a uh, uh, well result, uh, gradual uh, became uh, well known in Tibet. And uh, while in China, I think Jinshu and Eno, these are uh, southern and northern schools of the Chan school, they uh, debated. And uh, uh, yes, as uh, uh, you mentioned, I think Eno, uh, we know uh, this southern school became predominant in China. And these are. Uh, Lineage came to Japan as a Dogen's, you know, a philosophy of Zen, just to sit uh, without thinking anything. This is a trend of the South, uh, I think, Southern uh, style of Southern meditation in China. And uh, while Rin Chi, Rinzai in Japanese, uh, they are more Northern school, like right? Jinshu's way of uh, more. Uh, thinking in a way, and so these two are uh, also existed in the middle or uh, history of Japan. Uh, I think this is very interesting to compare both the directions. That is my uh, thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. <laughs> I'm just going to make a really quick point <clears throat> that there was also a socio political faction between the northern and the southern school. And so it wasn't purely a debate that concluded in one being superior to the other. It was because the northern and southern were actually the types of dynasty, Chinese dynasty. The so-called um, northern dynasty com was composed of what was later to become, what was northern and what later become, became southern. And so as a northern dynasty, went into a decline, so did then the northern schools of Zen. Right. And the southern school became more dominant as a result of the socio-political factors of one dynasty versus the other. Right. So we're not thinking about it purely in the sense that one was more correct than the other, but in fact that there was a whole other complex of issues that made one more um, dominant 
over the other. <laughs> and I know if I open that kettle of worms, it would right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just giving you a yeah, quick yeah, summary they're, on that. They're, they're, I mean, they're, again, <clears throat> in all these uh, intro uh, intro discussions, there's so many so many rabbit holes you can go down. So uh, I appreciate everyone's patience in the generalization, glossing over of many of those things. So thank you. So